This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. I'm Mel Choice. I'm a design engineer at Automatic, um, and I mostly do UI design and front end development. Um, I'm also a WordPress core contributor, and I'll be talking to you about good design. So I know everyone just had a bunch of pizza, uh, so let's start things out a little bit easy. And uh, you know, just what is design in the first place? So design is creativity deployed to a specific end. You know, it's taking an idea, something intangible, and making it real. So everything we interact with day to day, you know, whether it's our transportation, our technology, uh, our clothing, has been designed um, in some way, shape, or form. You know, it's gone through some sort of formal design process. It's about problem solving. So the design process is geared towards solving the real problems and needs of individuals and companies. Uh, so why are you designing something in the first place? It's because somebody out there had a problem and you're trying to fix it by you know, making a website, making an app, uh, making uh, a better keyboard, whatever. And it's not just uh, what it looks like, uh, but it's also how it works. So, you know, I agree with my buddy Steve Jobs here. You know, it's not just the aesthetics. You know, you need to keep track of the entire experience of using something. So, you know, what makes design good in the first place? It's a really, you know, people tend to think that design is a very subjective topic. Um, I disagree a little bit, but, you know, it's one of those things you, you know good design when you see it. Uh, so I like to joke that dividing the, that... Defining good design is a lot like Justice Potter Stewart's definition of pornography in the Supreme Court case. You know, I know it when I see it. And I think that's mostly true for everyone. You know, people have kind of an intuitive grasp on whether or not something is well designed. You know, that could show itself through the frustration that you feel uh, when you use a website that doesn't work. Or, um, you know, when you sit down into like a really nice Eames chair and you're like, oh man, it's a comfortable chair. So the best definition I've heard of good design comes from a fellow called Dieter Rams. Uh, he's a German industrial designer. Uh, he pioneered the idea of less and more. So his products were both beautiful and functional. He had 10 principles that define good design. So first of all, good design is innovative. Um, you know, you can't come into the field like, you're not going to be the next Facebook, you know? The person who's there first is the one who's going to end up like blazing all the trails. Uh, do any of you know those tasty videos on Facebook? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, you know, scrolling through Facebook, you see this, like, cute little, like, short recipe clip. Um, I, I, for some reason, I end up watching them, like, all the time. So every time I see one, I watch it. Um, but there's a lot of companies now that have come into this space and tried to do the same little, like, Facebook clips of recipes. And none of them are nearly as good as the tasty ones. And when I see it, at first, I'm like, oh, it's one of the tasty videos, you know? So the people who came in second you know, trying to like get into this market, they, they're almost enhancing the brand recognition of Tasty. So, you know, everyone else just kind of feels like a cheap knockoff. This one's kind of a no-brainer, but good design is attractive. You know, it has to look good. It has to, you know, make you go, ah, wow, this is nice. So good design also makes a product useful. You know, something that looks nice but isn't actually useful in any way, shape, or form isn't design, it's art. Good design also makes a product understandable. You know, you should be able to look at a car and go, okay, that's a car. It'll take me from point A to point B. You know, a well-designed corkscrew, for instance, will help you intuit how to open a bottle of wine. Um, a poorly designed one will help you fumble with it until you break the cork off and then you like try to fish the cork out and you're just having a bad time. You know, a well-designed website will help you navigate the information you're looking for, you know, without having to like search through mystery meat navigation or, you know, go digging, or, uh, you know, when you're trying to call somebody, like a restaurant, and their website has their phone number in an image. <laughs> you know, it should not only be understandable by you, but it should be understandable by your technology. <laughs> Good design is also unintrusive. It, it, you know, it shouldn't get in the way of you accomplishing your task. Uh, so, you know, what is obtrusive is when you get, like, a paragraph into reading an article uh, and you get a modal pop-up being like, subscribe to our newsletter. And you're like, maybe later, but right now I want to read your article. So, you know, it doesn't, good design doesn't get in the way and it doesn't distract people. So it's a, a tool to fulfill a need, but it's not the focus of that need. 
Good design is honest. It doesn't pretend to be something that it's not. So it doesn't advertise itself as a luxury car when it's really just like a Honda Civic, you know? Honest design is totally upfront about you know, what it can and can't do, and it doesn't try to sell people on empty promises. Good design is also built to last. You know, your site shouldn't need to be totally redesigned every year. You know? It should be designed in such a way that you know, it still looks good maybe two or three years later. And you know, that's not to say you can't iterate on things during that time, but the structure of the design should be pretty sound. You, know? you shouldn't need to like, scrap everything and like, build it afresh just to be able to iterate a little bit. Uh, a design that follows you know, period-specific trends specifically is going to look dated pretty quickly. And you know, a good design is thorough down to the last details. So nothing is left to chance. You know, every minute detail has been accounted for. On the web, this translates to things like uh, confirmation messages, error states, when a page has no content, which happens a lot, when a page, uh, page has too much content, which also happens a lot. You know, all these details should be thought about. You know, think about the edge cases. Good design is also environmentally friendly. You know, this makes a lot more sense when you're thinking about industrial design, like, oh, you know, the thing that I'm making shouldn't negatively impact the environment. Um, but on the web, I actually like to think that, like, you can apply it to the web itself. So good design doesn't harm an ecosystem or the people in that ecosystem. So this means protecting your users' information, their privacy, and shielding them from abuse and harassment. So if your site doesn't protect its most vulnerable users, then it's not really eco-friendly. You know, finally, good design is as little design as possible. Less, but better. It's simple, it's uncomplicated, uh, and it concentrates on like the most important parts of a product without burdening it with extra options. So that's well and good, you know, but what does good design look like? You know, not everyone can invest in a full-time designer uh, for their company or even hire somebody else to build their website. There's a lot of people who end up bootstrapping their own websites, and that's actually really cool. So if you're a small business owner, you know, you might not even need to hire somebody to build you a website. Something like, you know, a free or inexpensive WordPress theme could be good enough to accomplish what you need for now, you know, especially as your business is small. But if you are building something yourself, you really need to at least recognize what good design looks like so you can, be, uh, you can make more informed decisions when you are building your site. So let's take a look at some design fundamentals. Grids are fun, you know, they're the underlying structure of your designs. They're like the frame of your car. So using a grid provides a solid basis for starting projects. Uh, it allows you to easily align elements uh, with some sense of coherency and consist consistency. It's, uh, and then alignment is the, the placing of elements on top of that grid. So aligning elements to a grid, you know, whether it's text, images, whatever, it helps guide your eye down the page and it brings order to your website. You know, it just makes everything look better. So, you know, let's take a look at this layout. Everything's kind of all over the place. Nothing really lines up with anything else. It looks really messy. You know, it's hard to figure out what to look at first. And if we start adding some guides to indicate where elements do line up, you can see that there's a ton of different points of alignment. So, okay, so let's look at this layout, which is now, you know, the same content, but put on a grid. Fewer guides, everything lines up really well, and it makes it just a much more coherent design. So white space is a space on your site that's not taken up by content. Like grids and alignment, white space helps guide the eye down the page and establish hierarchy. So elements with more space you know, between them stand out. Elements that are close together without a lot of white space look like a group. You can use white space to uh, emphasize things like important messages, titles, block quotes. Uh, proper white space makes your content feel easier to read, and so your messages are going to be absorbed better by your users. And I know that sometimes people are like, but I want to put as much you know, content as I can in as small a space as I can so that everyone can see everything. But you know, space is good. White space is good. You, know, you really do want to give your elements ample margins and padding. Uh, you know, don't worry about fitting everything into a small space, especially like now as our screens get bigger, they get smaller. Like, there's no one way to see a website. So you know, embrace some space. So there's typography. Uh, which is my personal favorite fundamental. And, you know, 95% uh, of, of web design is typography. Uh, and the fun thing about this quote is that it's actually 10 years old. 
Uh, it was written in 2006, and it still applies today. So still, even still, most of what we consume on the web is text. You know, it's Facebook posts, it's tweets, it's articles, uh, blog posts, emails, Slack. You know, it's all text. You know, but that said, choosing fonts for your website is pretty hard. And, you know, pairing two fonts together is especially hard. So when you are choosing fonts to pair together, you know, the first thing you want to think about is your tone. Are you making a small business website, uh, a personal code portfolio? So you want to consider both your purpose and your audience when you're, you know, you're picking a font. So your developer portfolio probably doesn't need like shiny, scripty headers, um, but it does need a really solid monospace uh, mono font to put your code examples in, so they're easy to read. And if you're unsure what kind of tone you're going for, you know, for most people, something totally neutral works. You know, not a lot of hanging bits or crazy stylization, and you know, if you could describe it as fancy, then you know, you probably don't need to use it for most sites. You also need to consider legibility and readability. So are your fonts easy to read? You know, did you pick a body font that looks good at like a smaller size? Uh, if people can't read your content, then your site or product are, has already kind of failed. And worst comes to worst, just steal pairings from other sites, you know? You could use your browser's inspect element tool to identify what fonts a site is using. Um, or you can use like a browser extension that does the same thing. It just lets you select and be like, what font is this? You know, I like to think that like, there's only so many combinations that you could do. And if like me, you end up mostly using free fonts, you know, a lot of other people are using them. It's good to see how other people have used them because then you could also like duplicate their, their sizes. Yes. Now, Robin Williams always said to use one font per page, but that's your thing, fonts, right? Mm -hmm. So you probably use a bunch of them, which is this pairings. Robin Williams? The web design guy? Well, probably 10 years ago, before your time. I don't know. She's a writer. She's a writer. writer. Oh, okay. She, she is a writer. Okay. I read a really great article by Huffler & Co. earlier today about pairing typefaces that clash together. Um, and when it comes down to it, like, you could use one font, like, especially if you have one that has a really uh, like, large number of weights. There's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with like, just that one. So you could use like, that, you know, that font in a really thin weight for your headers, and then like, a regular weight for your body, and then like, italics for captions, etc. Um, so you could use one if you want, but it, it does need to be, you know, more than just like regular and bold, I think, to get like nice contrast and hierarchy in your type. And actually that leads into size. Uh, so you need to make sure that your uh, fonts are large enough to be readable um, because it really sucks if you're reading something and it's just so small that you either have to like put your face to your screen, which I find myself doing more and more as my eyes get worse, <laughs> uh, or um, you know, use your browser to um, like command plus and make the text bigger. So I would aim for a uh, body text of at least 14 uh, pixels. You know, 16 is good if you're trying to meet um, 508 compliance, so if you're doing any sort of like government projects. And you know, depending on the style of your site, you could even go up to as, as big as 20, you know, depending upon how you've constructed your site. So that might look good if you have like a single one column site. So like for a while, Jeffrey Zeldman's site uh, was just running a simple one column theme, and his body font size was like 22 pixels, but it looked really good. Um, but I tend to think that the 14 to 18 range is kind of the sweet spot. Um, but it also depends on your headers, you know? So if your body font is really big, your headers probably need to be even bigger or even smaller. So think about contrast, you know? Make sure that you're thinking about hierarchy as well when you're choosing your font sizing. So line height, uh, which is the amount of space pretty much between lines of text, uh, is also really important for making beautiful and readable text on the web. And it's honestly one of the most overlooked things I see. There's so a lot of people uh, who just leave it at the browser default, which is like one times the size of your body font, and that looks really cramped. So I recommend for body copy to go with 1.4 to 1.6 times the size of your font size. Uh, you can get a little closer for headers. I actually really like you know, 1.2 to 1.4 for headers. Um, but you know, in general, it's just like it makes it pretty nice to read. So this top example, you know, it's not bad, but it, it still looks pretty cramped. You know, I see a lot of sites with, you know, text that's as cramped. If, you, if you're reading like a whole article on this site, it just starts to tire out your eyes pretty quickly. 
But if you give it some more space, you know, it makes everything just a little bit easier to read. So the same kind of thing goes for line length, which is how long your text, you know, spans across your screen. Kind of the rule of thumb is 50 to 75 characters per line. You know, sometimes more is okay, sometimes less is okay. You know, on a small device like your phone, you're, you know, you're not going to be able to get 50 to 75. So, you know, you just got to play around with it, see, how, you know, until it looks kind of hard to read. And, you know, sometimes you see sites where the text stretches across the entire screen, uh, which can get really wide if you have, like, a nice big monitor, and you're like, oh, man, that paragraph that should be, like, five lines normally is just one line. Uh, so instead, you should consider giving your text area some sort of max width, just to make sure it, you know, it never gets too long to comfortably read, regardless of your screen size. So another thing, color, incredibly important for your design. In my opinion, because I'm bad at color, it's one of the hardest design fundamentals to do well. So research conducted by the Seoul International Color Expo in 2004 found that 92.6% uh, of people make purchasing decisions based on how something looks, especially its color. So there are some people who won't even buy a product if it doesn't come in the color that they want. Uh, they also found that color increases brand recognition by up to 80%. Uh, so, for example, uh, Apple's colorful iMacs rejuvenated their failing market by helping them stand out from PCs, which were all uniformly, like, slate gray at the time. I don't know how many people, uh, you know, were especially print designers in the room, uh, but a lot of designers remember the, like, the Mac G3s as, like, the first computer they designed on. And they were so iconic looking that, like, even just, like, looking at, like, the bubbly, like, colorful computers kind of, like, brings up good feelings. Smart use of color, aside from making you feel good, uh, could also lead to an increase in conversions, which is great if you're trying to get people to buy something or sign up for your product or service. So color can have a big impact on conversions. So merely changing the color of your primary call to action button uh, can actually make an impact on people signing up. For formal by HubSpot uh, tested green versus red buttons on a landing page, and they found that the red button outperformed the green button by 21%. Pretty huge. You know, that said, there isn't a golden ticket, you know. Often the color that performs best is the color that stands out the most on the page. You can't always say red is always going to perform better. So if we go back to look at the example again, you know, notice anything interesting about the site's color scheme? There's a lot of green in it. So, you know, green is one of the most po prominent colors in that color scheme. So a green call to action button isn't going to stand out the way a red call to action button is. You know, so if you're looking at trying to increase conversions by, you know, changing colors, you know, look at the colors that you're already using and maybe try something that is a little bit different, you know. And then test. Testing is so important when you're especially trying to sell something on the web. Just make sure that you're, you know, you're either A-B testing or you're usability testing so you know that, like, your website is actually good to use. And making a color call, when it comes down to it, it's a hard task. Um, but there are some tricks that you can use uh, to make something that, you know, looks nice. So, back into, like, emotions. Uh, figure out what emotions you want your website or your app to evoke. You know, do some Googling into color theory about, uh, you know, what colors people associate uh, with those emotions. Uh, so, you know, blue is often associated with trustworthiness, and, like, purple is, like, you know, elegance and royalty. Uh, so, you know, once you figure out, like, oh, I want to use this color, and you might be constrained by your brand, like, if you have a logo, you might want to use that color. But, you know, take that color, or colors, and put it into something like Cooler, Adobe Cooler, uh, or Color Lovers, uh, which is a website, uh, to help build you a palette. So what they, they do is you could like, search for color palettes, you could generate color palettes. It's really good for getting something like, like, nice-looking colors that work in your palette without having to, like, figure it out yourself and look at a color wheel. Or, you know, what I do a lot of times is just to fall back to using white and, you know, some shades of gray, um, maybe with one or two accent colors. And, like type, if you see colors, uh, like a color palette you really want, you know, just snag it from another website. Just don't steal everything, because that's bad. And also try to balance out your colors. So, like, bold, bright colors attract a lot of attention, um, more so than, like, desaturated or lighter colors. So don't use too many bright colors. Like, don't make your colors compete with one another. Try to balance out your lights, your darks, your brights, your pastels, etc. So otherwise, people are like kind of assaulted by their screen, like, ah. 
Uh, also, don't use black. It's, it's, a, it's a weird kind of rule of thumb, but there's actually no such thing as pure black in the world. So, like, this thing, like, you know, you would say that it's black, but because it has color coming out, like, light coming onto it, it's not actually, like, pure black. And, like, this microphone also isn't pure black. You know, they tend to look, like, kind of garish uh, and unnatural on the web, especially. So, I like to use dark grays instead of black. So, if you're thinking, like, specific hex colors, uh, like, 222 or 333, uh, or you could take a color from your color palette and just make it darker. Um, especially if you like desaturate it a little bit and make it darker. And then it like it looks like a like a nice black without being like totally unnatural like zero zero zero. Hierarchy uh, is an amalgamation of all of the previous design basics. So you know it's especially important in typography, making sure your headers stand out from your subheaders from your paragraph text, etc. You could use color to create hierarchy and draw attention to particular elements, uh, making them more important than other elements on the page. Grids, alignment, and white space all guide your eye to certain elements on the page. So combining all of these together will help like, make your site easier to scan. And you know, good hierarchy isn't about wild and crazy graphics or the newest Photoshop filters or sketch. Uh, it's about organizing information in a way that's usable, accessible, and logical to everyday site visitors. So establishing hierarchy defines the focal points of your site. So it helps guide users through your page, you know, hitting upon the most important elements that you're trying to convey. Uh, it's also good to start thinking about like what's the most important thing on your site uh, for when you're doing small screen layouts, because ten, you know, you generally only have one column on a phone. So when you know how important everything is on the page you can arrange them in that order. So one thing I'll do sometimes is if I'm doing a redesign especially, I'll take all the elements on the page and then like try to regroup them or like cut out anything that doesn't need to be there, but then like just put them on a wall, like with sticky notes, being like this is the most important thing, second most important thing, and then there you've already designed the architecture of your small screen. Okay, so enough of the basics. Uh, why does this matter in the first place? You know, why is good design important for your business? Good design is good business in general. Like, what do all these products have in common, uh, aside from their kind of eerily similar color palettes? Anyone know? They all have a designer in their founding team. So it's no accident that many of the world's top, brand, world's top brands are also design leaders. Uh, companies that invest in design and make design a key part of their strategy uh, tend to outperform companies that don't put the same kind of value on design you end up just making more money. A 2004 study by the Design Council found that effective use of design uh, supports up to a 200% business performance improvement. Uh, so why is that? That's, you know, that's a big jump. Good design establishes trust. You know, a well-designed website appears much more trustworthy than a poorly designed website, especially if you are trying to get people to like, sign up for your service or buy one of your products, you know, the more trust your users have in you, the safer they feel buying from you or giving you their contact information or recommending you to their friends and colleagues. You know, anecdotally, when choosing between two options, I will always go with the one I think is better designed, but I'm a designer. Uh, so in a study on how people determine a website's credibility, almost 50% of comments contain something about the site's design. You know, either like in general, like, oh, it looks professional, or in specifics, you know, talking about the layouts, the colors, so on. The article reads, the dominance of design may look surprising at first. One might ask, are people really so influenced by design look and not by more substantial issues? The answer appears to be yes. Design also creates an emotional connection between you and your users. So, you know, you don't just want your users engaged. You want them delighted. You want them to take joy in using your product or your site or your app. Emotional experiences actually imprint on our, on our memories. People will forgive your shortcomings, uh, follow your lead, uh, sing your praises if you reward them with positive emotion. Uh, it's from a book called Designing with Emotion, which if you're interested in design is a really good read. So customers who have uh, positive, positive emotional experiences with you and your product are 87% uh, more likely to purchase again, 75% more likely to recommend the company, and 63% more likely to forgive your mistakes. Which is important because everyone, when it comes down to it, is gonna make a mistake at some point or another. 
So good design skills, uh, a design that's well-researched, that's beautiful, that's easy to use, marketed to an audience who finds it useful, will bring in the money, not only that you spent building it, but will save you money in the long run. For a design to be successful, it's important to focus on how your product works in addition to how it works. So back to that Steve Jobs quote. IBM found that companies who skip the ease of use phase uh, in their like design building uh, end up spending 80% of their service costs on unforeseen user requirements down the road. So this is like fixing bugs that you could have caught in usability testing, uh, reworking your product to make it more usable in general, or uh, even pivoting directions to target a different audience. So say you were like, I'm gonna target like moms in their 20s, and it turns out that like women in their 60s are really the one that want to use your product. If you had done more research in the first place, you would have found that out early. So by investing especially in user experience design uh, when designing its product, McAfee ended up saving 90% in support costs. So that's a whole lot of time you don't need to spend walking confused customers through your product or service, which I just did a support rotation recently at my company and there's a whole lot of stuff I wanna make easier to use after that. And it, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a small business, an online retailer, a freelancer, even a local copy shop. You know, good design is worth the investment. We've come to a point where good design is not just expected, um, it's demanded. So in this kind of competitive market, mediocre and poor designs just don't cut it anymore. The competitive landscape, especially in the tech industry, is too saturated. A poorly designed product is not going to be able to flourish. Uh, so whether you hire a design expert uh, to come help you, uh, or you improve your designs on your own, it's definitely worth the time and the money. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Where's the kitty cat? You told me to have that kitty cat. Did I? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I can try to find you a kitty cat real, real fast. <laughs> I have a question. Um, what do you think of some of the new designs where they have three words? You scroll down and there's two words. You scroll down and there's four words. I feel like it's hard to make a judgment call without knowing what the words are. Yeah. Because if they're really effective words, like maybe it's working. But if it's like, we're creative, we're, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of like, it's a weird conversation to have, like if you're, especially if you're like an agency, like there's a lot of agency websites that all kind of look the same, they like all fit the same bill. Um, are they effective? Like if they have a lot of work, maybe their websites are okay like that. I don't know. It's complicated and I don't know that I can answer that without saying specifics. Okay. Yes. Can you talk about uh, what you see as the Oh my god. I, I, so I did a talk like this recently, but gradients, decorative gradients, are all over the place now, and I predicted it, and they totally are. So, um, I wonder if I could... Um, let's see. No, actually, it's not going to work. Okay, so uh, that's really popular right now. Um, other things that are really popular right now. Um, we still haven't gotten over the craze of big images with text on them. I don't know that we will get over the, the phase of big images with text on them. Um, but I also think maybe performance is going to be more of a thing that we talk about in the next year, hopefully. Um, especially as it becomes like more obvious that the majority of the world is either on uh, smartphones for like their internet connection uh, or like lower bandwidth internet, uh, that it is like, we need to stop serving people like five megabyte images and like, you know, 10 megabytes of JavaScript on the page and like, you know, building themes that come with 10 different sliders that are all called and like, you load the page and like, even my like 15 inch MacBook Pro starts, like the fan just starts getting super hot and loud and, you know, I, I really hope that in the next year or two, we do start to focus as an industry on making, uh, you know, designing for performance. So, I don't know if that's a trend as much as I think I'd like to become a trend, but people are talking about it. Yes? Could you explain how the decorative gradients are Oh, yeah. So, I've been seeing it everywhere. So, like, gradients were super popular in, like, the Web 2.0 era, um, but they were more, like, subtle gradients to add depth and texture to a page. Now, I'm seeing things like 
bright red to like bright purple gradients on like backgrounds and buttons and like sometimes it looks cool and sometimes it looks kind of garish it depends on how it's applied uh, but I think we're really getting into like blending bright colors again I actually feel like it's a an offshoot of uh, flat design and um, like Microsoft's like own version of flat design um, where it was just like solid color blocks like now we're taking those color blocks and we're blending them together into a nice bright gradient um, I kind of love it in some ways, uh, and in other ways it's a little bit like, oh god, we're going over the top. Yes? Craigslist, right? It's the ugliest site in the world. But it's effective. But it's ridiculously effective. Yep. What, um, what are some of your thoughts on it? If it works, it doesn't matter that it, like, it's, I even feel like it's not even ugly, it's just basic. So, like, if it accomplishes the need that it sets out to, which it does, then it's effective design. It's just not beautiful design. It's functional design. Yes? Uh, it seems like it would fit right into the, the mindset, the emotion that you're trying to create there, too, is that it, you're looking for that cheap way to do something. Yeah, exactly. It, it looks cheap. Actually, I, so I feel like I heard this was a thing that GoDaddy did for the longest time, but they intentionally looked cheap because they are a cheap host. So you associate it with, like, oh, I need cheap hosting. I'm going with GoDaddy. They look cheap. And I think it was like pretty successful for them. I don't think that's the direction they're, they've been going in in the past couple of years where they've like really incre increased quality, but. Yes. Uh, what do you think about the current WordPress themes they have right now? I mean, I have two blogs and I wanna change the way they look, but I don't wanna do a big dramatic change. Mm -hmm. Just a really subtle, something that looks a little bit more appealing than what I have now. So WordPress themes are such a big topic because there's so many different kinds. I know. I just, I just don't have the time to go through all of them. Um, so WP Tavern, every now and then, will cover new themes that come out. And I think they only do free themes. Um, but their reviews are usually pretty nice. Uh, so it's a, um, a news site, WPTavern.com. WP what? Tavern. Tavern? Yeah, like go in and have an ale tavern. Oh, that kind of tavern. Yeah. Okay. Um, also... Um, so I work for WordPress.com, and we make a lot of themes. Uh, but also, we work with a lot of partner um, theme builders, like a lot of uh, like pro builders. Uh, so if you go to WordPress.com and you look at the themes that we offer, um, pretty much everything that we offer is available for like self-hosted installs and has been vetted by us. Um, so it's a pretty good judge of like this like this theme is pretty high quality, and like the theme authors like care a lot about their code, and you know making like really like, nice beautiful themes. So if you are looking for a new theme, that's a good place to like go and like check and see like what's been pre-vetted and like what you think looks good and then you could either buy it or download it for your self-hosted site. Yes? Um, in moving between um, platforms, moving between the web and print, uh, what are your observations on sort of what are the guidelines and the differences in publication? I'm thinking specifically of magazines, long-form publications, media. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you think the, 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 the subtle changes or maybe some of the dramatic changes might be going back and forth? So the, the big thing there is constraints. They have totally different kinds of constraints. So the good thing about print is that you could literally do anything you want on a page, and as long as it fits into the page that you're printing, you know, you'll be able to do it. Uh, I mean, within reason. <laughs> uh, on the web, you can't necessarily do that, especially, like, the, your beautiful pixel perfect layout um, doesn't scale across devices and sizes. Um, so with web, you kind of have to set yourself free of the idea of like pixel perfection because it's never going to look exactly the same across all devices, across all browsers, across all operating systems, you know, whatever. Um, but print, there's so much creativity that could be brought back into the web, especially now that we're able to do more creative layouts. You know, there's a lot of really cool stuff coming in the pipeline, uh, like uh, in like new HTML elements, like uh, CSS grids. Um, you'll be able to do grids in HTML and CSS eventually. <laughs> uh, Flexbox is cool and has, you know, made it possible to do a lot more interesting layouts than we necessarily were able to do a couple years ago. So like. It's funny because like print is where design like really like got awesome, and then we got to the web, and everything was like 
pretty poorly designed for a while because we didn't have the tools to be able to make the same quality designs that we had in print. But now I think we're at a point where we do have this, like, the tools to build layouts that look as good in print as they do on the web. So I think it's a pretty exciting time to like, be involved in the web because if you were a print designer, this is where you finally get to bring like, all of that experience and kind of make it shine again. Yes? Oh man. Logo <laughs> <laughs> well, is another one of those really hard things. Um, I mean, I feel like the like tradi like the traditional answer is something that's like iconic and simple. It's like think of the Nike logo or like the Apple logo, you know. And especially like a lot of people tend to start with more complex logos, and then like as their brand establishes, you can like call it down to fewer and fewer elements. Um, also, hire a good logo designer. <laughs> Logos are hard, and I'm actually quite bad at them. Um, it takes like a very, I think, specific kind of thinking to get them right. Um, yeah. So I guess simple is better. Sometimes. It depends. <laughs> it's kind of my answer to everything is it depends. Any last questions? Cool. Thank you.